this is Michelle at Jasami Bookworm Podcast. And I always say I'm really excited about the chat I'm going to have on the day. And I'll say it again today. I am super excited to have uh, Taylor Sung with us. And she works at Glasgow University. I'm going to ask about it. But first, welcome, Taylor. Hi, Michelle. Thank you so much for having me. Um, Yes. So please, so please tell me a little bit about what you do at the university. Sure. Absolutely. Um, so Michelle, as you said, I'm here at Glasgow University. I'm known as Taylor in the writing world. I'm known as Taeyeon. I use my Korean name in a writing in a writing context. And yes, I am both student and staff at University of Glasgow. I originally came here for a master's in theater studies, and I didn't know that I would like it so much that I became a forever student. And now here I am just finishing the second year of a PhD in creative writing. Uh, so it kind of just goes to show that you never know where life's going to take you or what's going to happen. And on the staff side, I have a part-time role in the School of Culture and Creative Arts, and I'm a um, events assistant and events coordinator for an initiative that we have here at University of Glasgow called Thinking Culture, which is basically um, how can I how can I best describe Thinking Culture? Um, there's kind of a few aims really. So it's just about bringing creative practices and cultural programming not just to University of Glasgow but to the entire city. Um, Quite often, I think in academia, there's this very like gatekeepy idea of like, oh, well, I'm not an academic. I'm not welcome or meant to be at these University of Glasgow events. That's not our ethos at all. It's very much about with doors open, everyone is welcome. All the events are free. So it's bringing new voices to our community and then also creating new avenues of exposure for students and staff for creative and diverse voices. Voices to the community. It's what we're so involved in, in our yeah. commitment to community. So just uh, delve into that a little bit more, please. Voices to the community. Sure. Um, mm -hmm. So basically with what Thinking Culture, what we do is we really want to show a broad range of representation across all different creative practices. So be that writing, performing, music dance um and like these are people who are local within Glasgow and the surrounding area who want to show their creative practice to people that might not otherwise see it um but I guess also as well for our audiences to think about to think about how can I say like new ways of engaging creative practice so like People might have one idea of what music is, but then they attend one of our events and they walk away going, oh, perhaps being a musician can also mean this, this, and this. Um, just as an example, this October, which I believe this episode is airing in October, we yeah. will have a um, event that I'm very excited for, for Black History Month. One of our new academics in, um, I believe, comparative literature, she, she's, really, she's putting on an evening of spoken word to really highlight and spotlight the diverse voices from the Black and Afro-Caribbean community, not just on our campus, but through Glasgow and the surrounding area. Giving a voice to uh, to words and language mm -hmm. and expressing it in whatever culture it may be, it's so important. Which brings me to the first time I ever saw you, you were on a panel at the Mela Festival. And it contained one of my two favorite things in the world, food, subject of food. Sure. Uh, I love food from all over. But the panel, it, it and you particularly and everybody else that was there spoke about it so eloquently and what it has to do with you personally, uh, but also with your heritage. So please explain a little bit about more about that, Taylor. Sure. Um, um about the that panel specifically or about me yes. and my uh, well, we'll start with the panel and then we'll specifically about you please okay um yeah so the panel that um you attended was a really exciting collaboration that we had between the thinking culture program that i work for and the um kavya prize which is a writing prize for um authors 
of a ethnic minority background who have a connection to Scotland. And funnily enough, I kind of had an affiliation with both sides of this panel. As, as you know, I'm an employee for Thinking Culture, but I was also a shortlistee for the second year of the prize. Um, so both of those things kind of just fit together perfectly. Um, so when the Kavya Prize wanted to put something on for the Mela and they approached my team, I was kind of already involved in a way, if you will. So basically that stage was comprised of either past winners or shortlistees of the Kavya Prize um, talking about writing cultural identity and its connection to food and how we can approach not just our cult, not just our creative practice, but all the way, but also the way that we think of our identities in a very decolonized way. Um, and then just, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, no. I was just going to say, just, just, so just specifically in touching on myself, um, there were people on that stage, for example, such as um, Sean, there were people on that stage, for example, such as Sean Wei Kyung and Sumaya Usmani, whose work very much centers on memoir and food, which my, my personally for me, myself, mine doesn't do that. But as a fiction writer, food is very much a part of the world building and the reminding remind and a reminder of space and place for the the world that my characters inhabit and i think for me as like a korean person food and being korean is inseparable in so many ways and what was most important and now we'll get to the personal aspect mm -hmm. of what sure. you chatted about during that panel is your um, relationship, obviously, with food and Korean food. Uh, could you please express that on a broader range for everybody? Sure. My relationship with food and Korean food, that's such a big question. Um, I guess one first is just, I love it. What's not to love? I um, agree. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> I love it. But I think for me, um, when I've really started... Well, no, not when I really started. That's not, I shouldn't say it that way. But just to give some context into like how I've come to think about this, I grew up in the United States and I moved to Korea as soon as I finished university and kind of spent all of my young adulthood in Korea. And then I found myself in Scotland for postgraduate studies. So kind of going from living in Korea for such a large period of my life, like really a third of my life I've lived in Korea. Um, and just having Korean foods being such a part of my everyday life and my everyday interactions with people to then coming to Scotland, it really, like that move really made me think about it in a different way um, in the sense that a funny thing happened in the time from when I arrived in Korea to left in Korea and left Korea to come to Scotland in 2020. And that somehow being Korean and Korean stuff became cool. And I'm not sure how I feel about that. I have a lot of very, very mixed feelings because when I was a kid, being Korean was never cool. And now suddenly, because it is because of BTS or dramas or whatnot, suddenly it's a very trendy thing. But the trajectory of this narrative and how Korea is represented is not something that's really, how can I say? It's not that narrative doesn't come from Korean people. Quite often it comes from people of people of authority who are usually white, who are controlling that narrative. So in some ways I see this as like very much like a, how can I say, like a pop culture, neo-colonialism, if you will. And that comes with a lot of really complex feelings, just given the Korean Peninsula's history with colonialism itself. Um, so when I came to Scotland and I saw that the way that Korean food was being represented and by who and in what manner, um, it kind of, it, it, it really made me think about at what cost this is happening and what are the repercussions that people aren't seeing? Um, I won't name names, but there are Korean restaurants that are owned 
by white Scottish people. And what I dislike about that is that Korean culture becomes a way of making money. And the difference between me and that restaurant owner is I cannot take off being Korean on and off like a hat. That restaurant owner can take off his Korean cap and then go into the world and benefit from white male privilege. I cannot. Um, and that's something I really started thinking about once I moved to Glasgow. Um, so with that said, it's like, it's not that I'm accusing these restaurants of being inauthentic because for me as a diasporic Korean, like there are other Korean people who would say the same thing about me. But really more what it comes from is the people who are profiting off of the trendy aspects of Korea. What is their colonial relationship to the actual people that live there? Yeah. <laughs> so since you've grown, you grew up in the States and yeah. then you went to Korea, did, did you, now do you reflect back on the States and, and food with, that was there and restaurants that were there? Or is it just since you came here that you really noticed the difference? And if so, if you just noticed the difference, do you reflect back on your early years and recognize what you see mm -hmm. now? Definitely. So I think a lot of that reflection really started to happen here. Just because when I was growing up, being Korean was not a cool thing. Um, if anything, I feel like during my upbringing, like in the 90s, a lot of, let's see, a lot of the Korean culture that was seen through the American lens was kind of overshadowed by Japanese pop, pop culture at the time. Um, and I think also the difference is the Korean food that I interacted with was in the United States was from within my own cultural community and through these smaller, like little Korean neighborhoods. I myself never grew up in a city that was large enough to have a proper Korea town. Um, but it was also just kind of like an assumed thing that for me, a Korean restaurant were these little mom and pop places where I would go in and everybody was speaking Korean or quite, quite often, like more often than not, it was like this little kind of like food court at the very, very back of a Korean supermarket. So seeing Korean restaurants that were in it for um, cultural appropriation as a means of money making was not something I saw up until very, very recently. Um, I guess one way that I did really reflect on my childhood and the food that I had there was when I moved to Korea, because there's just because of a difference in availability of ingredients and you know, what can be imported, what what can be made readily. Like there are things that I had in Korea fresh for the first time that I'd never had fresh. They were always frozen. Uh, there's like a lot of very small local dishes that I love, but had never quite made it across the ocean just again due to the fact that they're so very, 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 very regionally specific. Um and so just to think about, like, how can I say? I guess the best way to describe it, if you think about what I learned about the food of my childhood is like, okay, here's, this is going to sound really weird, but imagine if there was a Scottish child growing up outside of Scotland and the only Scottish food they ever had came from Iceland. <laughs> Yes, and then so I, I, yes. can, <laughs> I can I can actually relate to that. Yeah. I can okay. actually relate to yeah. that in in a small way. Although I was born in Canada, all my family was everyone else was born in Glasgow. There so you go. Okay. For me, everything when I said I was going home, I didn't say Canada, I said Scotland. And when we found a shop that had you know, uh, rock candy or the okay. food that you could get, which yeah. you couldn't get back. Um, I hate to date myself, but the sixties and seventies, uh, you couldn't get it. So when you came home to Scotland, you, you just wanted to bring in the empty case and yeah. <laughs> take it all back so that I can empathize. Yeah. And you said it so beautifully, Taylor, absolutely beautifully <laughs> articulated that because I just reached out to me. Uh, 
so speaking about food, since it is mm. obviously with, you know, the, the cultures that are close to our heart, is there, is there a, a dish that your family made or when you were in Korea that they made there that was particular to a celebration that evokes a beautiful memory for you that you always associate with it? I might be putting you on the spot. I've been known to do that. Okay. <laughs> but when it comes to food. A Korean food that evokes a certain that, memory. Yes, a beautiful memory for you. By celebration, do you mean a holiday or not necessarily? Not necessarily. Okay. It could be something within you know, whatever you feel is a celebration. Okay. I'll, that's a really good question. So just, I guess the biggest thing for me is looking back now. In the, when I was living in the United States, I had food habits that were very, very Korean that I didn't know were Korean. And just like certain preferences for palate, like um, one example is that I absolutely adore dill pickles. Like I love, love, love. If there is a jar of dill pickles in my house, it'll be gone in a day. And like I just, people are just like, oh, yeah, she likes pickles. But I realized like, oh, like Korean people very much like to have acidic things to like cut through the richness of foods that are a bit more oily or a bit more like, how can I say, a bit more heavy, if you will. And I was like, oh, that's like, that's like a Korean thing. Because sure enough, when you go to Korea, anywhere in Korea, if you order pizza or pasta, it always comes with a little dish of pickle. Because Koreans want that to kind of like kind of cut through some of that cheese and help it like digest better. Um, so that was one thing. And then just always... Like, I remember at school, like, when we could, like, bring a snack, I would always have, like, cucumbers at a snack, and while all the other kids had, like, fruit snacks and, like, crisps and whatnot, and then when I went to Korea, there's, like, cucumbers everywhere, and I was like, oh, okay, <laughs> but just, uh-huh. Dill pickles, oh my gosh. I, I just that... realized there were two cucumber foods as well. Oh. <laughs> But what you say is true. I remember the festivals during the summer and they would have the yeah. festival and you would go on a ride and such and they would have the huge, big dill pickle oh, and they great. would wrap it up and you would eat it. And that was the one thing I will say. And and I love living in Glasgow. I love being here. But they don't know what a pickle is because the first time I went to a fish and chip shop and, the, and they said pickles and I went, oh. I can have a pickle and they put an onion in it and I and I was so confused <laughs> so when you say about the deal which it's funny because certain foods can cross over so many yeah. boundaries and your excitement about dill pickles and I <laughs> and I just <laughs> think that's phenomenal yeah. because I can relate and empathize yeah. with that so much uh, and getting a proper dill pickle is not oh. easy no. They're all very sweet here, aren't they, Michelle? Like the Gherkins yeah. are quite yeah. sweet and it doesn't. No, yeah. it's not the same. And that's mm -hmm. when you say, you try to say a dill pickle and they hand you a pickle and you're going, that's not a proper dill pickle. No. In, so you look for it. Yes, we go in search of a dill. We go in search of pickles. <laughs> yes. So yeah. that's a wonderful memory. That's an absolutely wonderful memory. So. I'm not much of a cook. I'm your basic kind mm -hmm. of, you know, yeah. assemble. I like fresh fruit. Mm -hmm. I like fresh veg. And I like, I, I will admit I'm a carnivore. So I like fresh yeah. meat. That's my basic thing. As long mm -hmm. as it's fresh. Is there a particular meal that you enjoy preparing at home? It might be simple, a little more yeah. complex. Which, which would you say is your favorite? Well, I have two. And I'll preface this by saying that I have ADHD, so if there's any recipe that's too complex or too many steps, it's just not going to happen. Um, so there's two. So one would be kimchi jjigae, like kimchi stew. Um, and I, I'll be, I'll admittedly say I make it like the lazy way, like it's a very much a dump everything in one pot and let it boil. Um, but I like that because it's very, very hard to mess up. It's always good. And actually, it's one of those things where if you have that kimchi that's almost about to go off that you've forgotten about, it actually makes the 
the tige better. So that's one that I like to make for sure. And then the other thing is actually just really simple. And this has always been one of my favorite food, but I love rice and eggs. So just like fresh steamed rice and like a fried egg or two, like usually two, let's be honest, <laughs> like a bit of whatever you want on top, like the Korean way would be a bit of sesame oil and um, soy sauce. And then you just eat it with like kimchi and like the dried seaweed. And that's always good. You can never go wrong. It's like my favorite lazy meal that <laughs> has everything you need. There, and and it's the flavors and you know what they bring back from memories and what's oh been definitely created yeah and what's definitely. been created. So in thinking about and thinking about food, is mm -hmm. there a message about um, Korean food that you would like to express? You know, for generally for people to be able to explore it here in a more uh, you know, a uh, way that you think would be a great way to explore Korean food. A message that I'd like to be able to express so that people here can. Sure, I guess something, and this, does, I don't think this just applies to Korean food, but for any food that comes from outside your own cultural community, is just as you engage with these different foods, know that they come from a tradition sometimes those traditions are painful sometimes those traditions are happy and that just to always decentralize your own viewpoints and then to always remember that the way that you view food and the world is not the default for everybody else so one example of this is that something that's surprisingly prevalent in korean food is spam and when I was a little girl, this was something that I was really embarrassed by because I would hear other kids go, oh, spam is gross. Ugh, what's in that? Ugh. Well, first of all, no, it's delicious. Second of all, that comes from a very sad place that comes from the Korean War when people in Korea were getting access to the rations of American soldiers and they were just trying to make anything that they could out of it because they had to look after their families. Um, so that's why context is so important. Um, and quite often, and I would say too, is one, there's the war, but also the fact that Korean, that spam is part of Korean culinary tradition, that wasn't the choice of Korean people. That was the result of our peninsula being divided by two countries and not ourselves. So it's, there's a lot of moving parts there. And just to keep that kind of context in mind and then kind of to decentralize your own personal beliefs that you hold with food is something that's really important to do. The way you've expressed that is so perfect yeah. to think about, uh, you know, food as a celebration is important and different mm -hmm. cultural foods are so important. And what you brought up about spam that people might, I've, I had that growing up. Mom made that uh, all the time. So <laughs> I actually loved it. I, I still have to do the certain memories. You're like a secret Korean person, Michelle. <laughs> <laughs> I do. I do love food. Oh, there it is. I am. Uh, oh, and kimchi. Yes. Yes. So, uh, but I think it's important that we think about it because spam, part of the culture, but it wasn't an origination in it but it's become so important. And I think learning about that, expressing it and knowing about food, not just taking food in, we do take it in because we need it nutritionally, but also because it's, it's so important and it's part of every celebration yes. and understanding, as you said, the context of where things come from, because it might, it's become part of it. However, painful memories or happy memories, yeah. It's those associations. So as we draw to a close, mm -hmm. uh, what would you like to say ab about cre uh, Korean food? Either, it, uh, I always like positive. It's always about right. positive with me. Okay. What, what message would you like to say about Korean food as an exploration? What would you like to say your personal message about Korean food? Say it to the world as a personal what? message, as a personal message to you about, you know, the food that you grew up with, experienced yeah. in Korea, and now here, what does that mean to you? And what does it mean to me? And what would I like to say to the world about it? Yes. 
Okay. That personal and message, because I think it's about personal. It's about you and yeah. you can express it so well from the, your, the variety of Thank where you. you've grown up in the States and Korea and then here. Sure. I guess what I would just, I guess just for me, it's a reminder, not a reminder. No, I guess just it's a way for me to find community um, wherever I may be. Um, so for example, like when I go and visit, you know, my good friend, Eddie Kim, he has his place on the South side of Glasgow, Gomu Kimchi, like, because Eddie and I are both Koreans of a diasporic background and of a similar generation as well. There are so many specific, um, conversations that we can both have just like for example the other day I was talking about like hey do you remember back in the day you could go to the Korean supermarket and they would sell these like big huge barrels of like these like little individual like jellies and cups and you're like, oh yeah, yeah we had those too so just um it's those little convers it's through Korean food that you find people where you can have these little moments and little conversations and just this for me it's always just a sense of community if you will. So with that said, what I would like to tell everyone else is that when you're engaging with Korean food, and not just Korean food, but of any food that comes from a marginalized background, try to be really conscientious about um, what um, local businesses you are patronizing. So for example, I would say like, if I were to look for a Korean restaurant or Korean business, I would be wanting to make sure that there are people either on the managerial side or in the not production side. Or I would want to know that there are people involved in that business or that there are mechanisms built into that business where Korean voices and Korean perspectives are not only heard, but also being compensated fairly for their effort. I encourage everybody definitely do your research. Um, Make sure you know the places that you're going to support migrant owned businesses, support ethnic minority owned businesses. <laughs> well, that's perfectly said. And we're going to put several links in there from our conversation, but include okay. obviously the link to Eddie's restaurant because I still Absolutely. want to visit it. I haven't done that yet, but we'll have that link in there. So as the final part and yes. it's the shout out time, I do this to everybody. So okay. who would you like to give a shout out to Taylor? It can be company, business, idea. What okay. shout out recognition to someone? Sure. Well, I just want to say a shout out to Glasgow and just thank you for scooping me up and giving a, me a big hug and embracing me and giving me like a little nest, if you will, to kind of like find my feet and figure out what, what the next steps in life that I want to do. Um, it's, I love being here at Glasgow Uni. And there's certainly a lot that I'll be thinking of fondly while I'm away in Korea. And I think Scotland is one of those places. And I mean, I'm, I'm thinking of Glasgow because that's where I am now. But it's this is one of those places where it just, it, Scotland always stays in your heart no matter where you go. And to be able to have that little piece of Scotland in my heart is something that I'm so very, very grateful for. You're going to make me cry in a minute I oh. <laughs> because uh, Scotland, obviously, and Glasgow in particular is near and dear oh. to my heart. So thank you for that shout out. <laughs> and uh, Going on the back of that, I'll say the shout out to uh, my mom and dad and they're in heaven. Yeah. I know that, but uh, I, they're my heritage, they're, you know, the ethos and values that with the company and what we have mm -hmm. and what we try to convey with this podcast. So my shout out is to my mom and dad. And I think that Glasgow is a perfect part. So thank you, Taylor. Yes. Thank you so much for joining us thank today. You, Not going to be your last visit. I have a feeling. Thank you very much. <laughs> And so this is Michelle from Jasami Bookworm Podcast. As always, I wish you all a sunny day.